Um, before I actually ask a few questions uh, of this you know, illustrious panel that we've got, I thought I might just um, give you some stats, some figures about Australia and where we sit as an innovation nation. So Australia produces 3 to 4% of the new knowledge in this world every year. Our population is 0.3% of the world. So we're punching on average 10 to 15 times better in terms of generating new knowledge. We've got five universities in the top 100 in the world. We've got 16 universities in the top 100 that are under 50 years old. The university sector is the fourth largest export earner in the country, bringing in $18 billion per annum. Well, it was last year, as I understand it. The, the journal Nature, the very prestigious journal Nature, ranks Australia 12th in terms of producing high-impact uh, publications. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, Glo the Global Creativity Index last year ranked Australia fifth in the world. And this year has ranked Australia first in the world. So it's really interesting the criteria that they use for, measure for measuring creativity. It's talent, technology, and tolerance. They believe those are the key ingredients to create a, uh, a, have a creative society. The Bloomberg Index, Innovation Index, has Australia ranked 13th. The Global Innovation Index says Australia 17th. The Global Innovation Index, in looking, breaking it down a little bit, says our human capital and research capabilities are ranked seventh in the world. Our innovation uh, efficiency, however, our ability to take new discoveries and turn them into economic benefits, we ranked 81st in the world. So it's a big difference from where we're innovative to where we translate things into practical outcomes. Our science and engineering graduates, we rank 73rd in the world. There's an issue around STEM. High and medium technology manufacturing, we rank 54th in the world. In terms of, in the OECD rankings, in terms of collaboration between industry and academia, we rank 34th out of 34 countries surveyed. So out of this, I interpret the data to say, we're good at research, we're great at generating new knowledge, we're poor at translating it into economic benefits. We've got issues with STEM, but we have the fundamentals in place for a knowledge nation. What we need is greater coordination and greater collaboration. So that's the, the scene that I'd like to set, and I'll now ask our panelists to give us their views on innovation and science in Western Australia. And I'd like to start off with you, Premier. Uh, first of all, you announced the, the science statement earlier in the year, and I was wondering if you could tell us your thoughts about uh, the comparative advantages and the strengths of science and innovation in Western Australia. Uh, thank you, Peter, and uh, first can I say well done to CEDA, and terrific to see, I think, 450 people here taking a very direct interest in the development of science and innovation uh, in this state, and I think that's incredibly encouraging in itself. Uh, look, I guess um, I took on the science portfolio as Premier, not that I tend to have any uh, prowess in science or indeed innovation, uh, but I thought it needed to be elevated, um, and particularly I'm talking about science at the moment. Uh, I thought we needed to take stock of what was the science effort in Western Australia, uh, including science infrastructure, for example, the, the Pawsey Computer Centre or Kieran McNamara uh, Biodiversity Area, whatever it might be, and also to um, determine in a sort of a policy sense uh, where do we have advantages and therefore where should we concentrate? And the science statement um, identified that. I don't think it surprises anyone, but uh, there was quite a lot of detail. And this state does have a history of science and innovation, but a lot of that has been based around our economic structure of mining, now petroleum, uh, and traditionally farming. And I think there's lots of good stories that have told there. Uh, what we're seeing now is uh, new areas being identified, again, you know, astronomy, um, biodiversity and others, um, and we've got big advantages. But also, I guess, on the innovation side, and uh, I'd concede quite openly, I don't think the government uh, has thought through its policy or done enough in that area, but we're about to. Meetings are literally taking place uh, over this week and the next couple of weeks. Uh, I think uh, that goes far wider. And I do make a distinction between science and innovation. 
Uh, but I think, if I can say on the science area, um, I would like to think what's been done over the last few years is proving successful. The fact that 450 people are here, the fact that there's far more discussion about science, uh, that the universities, uh, the government and the business sector are now collaborating uh, far better than they did before. So I see a strong direction, a strong enhancement. Uh, the current challenge is going to the broad area of um, innovation, I guess your comments, Peter, about turning science, turning discovery, turning uh, intelligent, innovative people into practical application and success is really where we're at. Mm. Cool. Thank you, Premier. Yeah. Might just turn to Colin. And um, Colin, you've <coughs> worked in big business with Chevron. You're now the Chancellor of uh, Curtin University. How do you see um, develop the development of closer links between academia and industry? Okay, maybe I can sort of take us on a little little journey just for a second, Peter. Um, and I'll start with sort of the, the big end of town, how it works with the universities. Uh, and sort of one way is, the simple way is to use them as consultants, in effect. And so you've got, you've got good people, you've got good apparatus, good, good, good facilities. Can you solve a problem for us? Uh, and, and that is the sort of the very immature end of the relationship. Uh, and then the, the relationship moves along in the direction, say, that WA era has taken, which is now, I guess, about um, 12 years old. And it's a collaboration between CSIRO, Curtin, UWA, uh, Chevron, Woodside, and more latterly, Shell, which is about building capacity uh, in the research sector. And when you've got that capacity in place, to then do quality, quality research. And I think that's why that relationship has, has strengthened and has, uh, and has lasted as long and it seems to be growing, uh, because it seemed to be the, that if you work together, you create better teams of researchers who are better able to not just deal with today's problem, but then work on perhaps any, uh, on future issues which are not fully understood yet. So I think that's an example. The next stage, I think, is what we need to do more of is, and I'll give you an example. I was at the University of Southampton um, just visiting a couple of weeks ago, and Lloyd's registered, registered shipping, and they certify all ships, offshore platforms and everything, have moved their research capability, their global research capability, to the University of Southampton. And you will see physical evidence of that is are two large buildings. One is part of the engineering faculty and one is the Lloyds one, which have been built at the same time, with shared laboratories and other facilities. And new, um, a major uh, tank, for towing tank and wind tunnel, which is available not just to Lloyds Register, but others. This is real collaboration. And it's, it's a statement by Lloyds that they will work with Southampton effectively forever. Um, and these are the sort of things that I think we need to be looking, looking to do at the sort of what I call the big end of town. Um, in the more in innovation space, I think, um, and Sean will have a view on this, we've got the Woodside, Cisco, Curtin, uh, Internet Every of Everything Innovation Centre, which the Premier uh, opened just recently. That provides a capability not just to the Woodsides to enhance uh, and improve the efficiency of their operations, but it's accessible to any number of new industries to come and trial what they want to, want to do um, uh, with, you know, with, with the access to supercomputing. Um, where we haven't, and so I think we're doing a good job at the big end of town, we could do more. Where we need to do better, I think, is in the, in the startups um, where, and, and in the innovators and incubating those, which really we don't do very well, I don't think. Um, and I, I, it seems to me what we need to do is to draw those onto our campuses and create a much closer physical working relationship between those that have ideas, whether they're actually in the university or from outside the university, um, and, and, and the university capability to help mature that. I think they'll have the benefit of a number of things. One is you've got access to all these people very readily. Um, the other thing is that I think it would decrease the risk of um, commercial failure. And if you decrease, decrease that risk, there's more likely that they're going to get access to funds, which is one of the problems we have in Western Australia and in Australia generally, is there isn't an active uh, funding arrangement. We don't have many angels, we don't have any real companies uh, that are set up to invest in startups, which is one of the reasons why we don't innovate very well mm. compared to the states, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's a nice segue into uh, to a question to you, Sean. We talked about uh, collaboration between industry and academia. Is it possible to have 
greater collaboration within industry between the big companies, for example. Is, you know, given the, the tensions surrounding IP, confidentiality and so on, and competition, how do you see uh, potential collaboration um, within, within industry itself? Uh, yeah, I think everyone's got their war stories of intellectual property getting in the way. You know, a year in negotiation, IP, and then it just, you know, your collaboration's dead in the water before it even started. Um, but I think that the environment's kind of changing a bit. Um, you certainly see movement afoot that IP is a, a more freer topic. I think we've had, you know, both success and failures of, of, the, of the, the recent past, and the successes have been around you know, really analysing internally in your own company or at the university or at the SME level, what is really core IP? What is secret to you? Right? And in oil and gas, that might be in exploration, right? but it's not in hull cleaning. Right? And so be honest with what's core IP and what's not. And then when it's not core, then that's a great collaboration topic. And I think the other success factor has been... Um, having the principal discussion up front with the collaborators. You know, so we collaborate quite often with you know, Chevron competitors, you know, Shell, and multiple universities at once. But have the principal discussion up front. Who's bringing what to the table? Who's going to own it when it gets improved? Uh, and you're going to find very quickly that whether you've got alignment or not in that collaborative adventure. And if you don't, at least you know in week one or day one, not a, you know, day 365 when you've burnt more legal bill than you've, you know, are going to get benefit from. So, you know, having that principal discussion up front, I just sets up for a much better framework going forward. Um, and I think there's a, there's a change afoot where more people are looking at it that way. And actually, when they're questioning that core IP, it, it's less and less. What you want is access. You want the solution. It's the small guy that's going to want the IP. They're going to make the money. You want to use the service at the end of the day. Fantastic. Might just come to Larissa and ask you a question about agriculture. You know, it's a key sector for the state. It's been highly identified in the Premier's side statement. How do you see innovation going on in <coughs> agriculture? Who are the drivers of ag uh, innovation in, in, in agriculture? Mm, Peter, we're, we're connected to these uh, Asian markets to our north. Um, it's a beautiful thing, but um, we're probably not doing enough to innovate. So, you know, for us, um, along the, the value chains into Asia, the, the competitive story is around a share of protein. And out of Western Australia, traditionally, we've been, uh, certainly in the grain sector, a bulk exporter. We haven't valued, value added much. Um, innovation in the grain sector relies on... Um, uh, productivity at the, the farm level, pre-farm gate, just to maintain 1% yield um, per annum. So we have um, great innovation at a, at a farm level. We've got a um, long history of, of adopters of um, extension technology at the farm level. And we do have a good base of, of uh, investment in, in um, plant breeding technology. Um, um, but we still have a long way to go. We don't have a, a capacity blueprint 20 years out in our food and ag sectors. Um, we haven't traditionally innovated in transport packaging processing, which is really important to us, you know, the cost of getting to market. So I'm optimistic about, about uh, innovation, but we've got a long way to go. Right, there's plenty of opportunities. Yeah. Cool. Jonathan, I wonder if we could just turn to you and uh, ask how, in the medical research sector, you see medical research institutes like yours, Telephone Institute, um, universities and departments of health, for example, coming together to, uh, to be innovative and improve health outcomes. Thanks, Peter. I mean, there's, there's some common themes emerging, as you'd expect. I, let me preface it by saying that I think things are changing very actively. I arrived in Western Australia a bit over three years ago. And I think it's fair, fair enough to say that it wasn't exactly a hotbed of collaboration um, amongst the health and medical research sectors. That there was a lot of competition between institutions, even within institutions, and my institution's no different. Uh, and the, there was a catalyst that occurred about three years ago, which was dubbed the Western Australian problem. And the Western Australian problem was a graph of the national medical research funding that was divvied up amongst the states. And the 
the component that came to Western Australia had been steadily dropping from about 10%, which is where people thought it probably should be based on a kind of per capita measure, to less than 5%, and it was heading south. And um, there was an acknowledgement at that time, there was a lot of hand-wringing, but an, an, an acknowledgement that we had to stop saying this is just because they don't understand us or they don't like us um, and recognise that in fact it's probably because we were putting pretty crappy applications in and that we weren't, re we weren't acknowledging that re the research world was changing. And there was that acknowledgement and the change in three years has been astounding from silo mentality within institutions and between institutions to a highly collaborative environment. And we certainly at Telethon Kids Institute, we built our whole strategic plan about a new way of doing research, highly connected to community, um, partnering with whoever we needed to partner with, focusing on outcomes. That has, um, at least on the child health campus, certainly been embraced. So we have established a strategic council for child health research that involves our institute, it involves the Child and Adolescent Health Services, so Princess Margaret Hospital and the other health services, University of Western Australia, Curtin University at the highest level. This will be formally launched next week. We've got Hendy Cowan as the independent chair. Um, we've been meeting on a regular basis to see how we can make research much more integrated into the service environment. And it continues. There's something called the Western Australian Health Translation Network launched this year. Uh, involves all five universities, the major research institutes and the lead organisation is the health department. And it's all about working together on research that's hopefully going to lead to better health outcomes. Um, and, and Lynn Beasley was telling me earlier about even the, the foundations are starting to understand these synergies with getting together the RAIN Foundation and the Bright Spark Foundation have formed an alliance. So it's a very different environment now and I think the the setting is ripe for great things in the future. I was, at, um, I was having breakfast with Peter Liedman this morning. We were talking about the opportunities on the QE2 campus. When we move with, with Perth Children's Hospital there, how great that's going to be and as a super campus for innovation. Uh, so I think there's, a, there's huge opportunities. There are challenges. Um, our challenge in health and medical research is what is our bottom line. All the other sectors re represented here have as bottom lines something that's pretty tangible, whether it's, whether it's a cash bottom line, whether it's a product production of a certain item bottom line. What's ours? It's public good, it's health. And, and yes, we also need to come back to what is the economic bottom line of the area we do, and I'd like to get back to that. But it's a challenge when you're dealing with your researchers whose traditional academic bottom line is a publication in a peer-reviewed journal, or it's a winning of a competitive grant. And that Yes, those are important measures and they're really important measures of knowledge generation and of peer esteem and of quality, but they're not the end game. The end game is how that knowledge is then translated into something useful. So we as leaders need to also change our language and focus on what is it that, that takes something from an academic setting, which can be challenging and lengthy as we've heard, into an output. And that's, that's part of the sort of thing we're trying to do. So in a way, it's not too different to some of the uh, innovation efficiency issues that have been identified in some of these uh, tables that I've been reading, where you know, you've got an idea and how, how do you actually translate it into something practical at the end. And, and I'd like us to see, we, we, there's lots of discussions about measures of impact, and that's important, but impact is not just what, you know, a, a child having a better health, that is obviously the most important impact, but it's also about how do you take something from a pipe, on, along the pipeline from discovery through to proof of concept, through to partnering with industry into the market. And it's, it's making sure that, that the quality at each point is exceptional and that we're not letting things rest at publication in a peer-reviewed journal. Sure. Can I just come back to you, Premier? Um, over a long period of time, Western Australia has invested uh, quite a lot in, in, in science and been generating data in, in lots of different areas. The Square Kilometre Array, for example, will generate huge amounts of data. Um, just wondering how you see the state's position in terms of data acquisition and the ability to analyse big data. Uh, well, I think um, I mean, the SKA is the uh, sort of standout science project, I guess, and probably one of uh, mankind's great research projects of this century. Um, fantastic in terms of the international partnerships, and that will spread wider across science and technology. 
Um, the data, I went and visited the site uh, a couple of weeks ago, amazed to see a room that was probably about twice the size of this stage that I was told was handling the amount of data equivalent to the World Wide Web uh, was handling. So, so suddenly we're right up there. Uh, I was also told that was the largest amount of data being handled anywhere in the world in, in one site. So that, the supercomputer, and uh, obviously uh, that opens it up. Uh, the government's also been uh, making available its own data, all sorts of data in all sorts of areas. Uh, and that's where I probably sort of make that distinction between what I see as a fairly pure science and, and applications into a whole range of areas. Uh, and that, that is the frontier I think we're in. I think we're on track on science, mm. from my point of view. Uh, I went out and looked at a uh, sort of start-up area. I'm learning, you see I'm learning. <laughs> uh, a start-up area. Uh, very interested to see, for example, one application. Uh, I don't regard it as science, but uh, using basically, I suppose, an app um, to reduce uh, theft of petrol from sta petrol stations. Very practical, large amounts of money, um, but not a science project, very much a technology application uh, into a very practical area. I guess the other thing I'd happen to uh, comment too, and it relates across a whole lot of areas, you know, as I've represented here, uh, some people will ask a rhetoric question in any area of government as to whether well, the government should do more, what should the government do? And I guess I ask myself that right now. But I come back to one sort of theme. I think government should do what industry or universities or hospitals can't do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's what drives it. So I'm looking for what should government do where there's that gap. And I think, um, you know, looking at Jonathan's area in, in child health research, I mean, building a new children's hospital, embedding Telethon Kids Institute within it, uh, government doesn't have to do the research. There are many government uh, people are involved in research. Um, and I think that's the sort of thing. Similarly, helping with the Commonwealth on the SKA project mm -hmm. and others um, and the Pawsey Computer Centre, that's the prime role of government to, to undertake the things that would otherwise not happen. And I, and I think, uh, as Jonathan was saying, the, um, what's triggered that, but the amount of collaboration between universities um, and government departments, uh, whether it be agriculture or health or whatever, I think is, is just transforming at the moment. So. Terrific. Mm. Can I just follow up on the, uh, the big data side with you, Sean? Mm. Um, it's been described as the new oil, the new gold. Data is the key ingredient these days. How does Woodside see its position in terms of uh, big data analytics? Where can others in that continuum, small to medium enterprises as well, participate in big data analytics? Um, yeah, uh, I think we've all been collecting data in realms and realms of it for you know kind of decades, and we certainly went on our own Voyager discovery over the past year on how much data we've been collecting, and it is kind of um, fascinating exercise to go through in your own organisations, and probably the government's got a lot of it as well. Um, it, I think one of the things that we noticed was uh, so big data isn't new, really. We've been doing it for a long time. I think what's new is the access, the tools and the ability to scale. So from a, a lot, we're a reasonably sized company, so we've been able to gain access to computing hardware and, and, and tools, but you know, we went from an idea and a concept at the end of last year to you know, nearly a quarter of a million sensors streaming every day. You know, from an idea to predict a valve failing to half a million predictions per day. It can scale tremendously quickly and it doesn't need very many people to scale. I think that's one of the big learnings we've had that we're sharing is that it doesn't matter whether you're a guy in the garage or you're a team of researchers at a university or you're a large corporate. You can start with an idea and scale it very quickly using today's technology. I think that's been the transformative change around big data is, is how it scales. Um, and then for WA, I think we've got a unique opportunity because um, the intellectual property of data science and the ability to predict, that's the science invented everywhere. I think WA is a town of entrepreneurs where people kind of get together. We're remote. So, you know, all of those characteristics, I think, can play to strengths that we can build on. And it, it turns out that we've got a lot in common with medical. We've got a lot in common with agriculture, the oil and gas and mining in how we can learn from the big data, if you like, the data science and how you apply this um, from one industry to another. And I think that's what we should be trying to, to create in Perth, mm. that ecosystem of learning what's working well, the lessons, and how we can transfer from one industry to the other. Well, it's a neat segue to go to Jonathan. 
and uh, the health records that Western Australia has been collecting since the 60s and 70s. That really is a treasure trove in many regards. You know, how can Western Australia maximise that wonderful opportunity that has given itself by collecting these health records over 40, 50 years? Oh, so Peter's talking about this concept of data linkage, which um, Western Australia has been certainly Australia's leader, one of the world leaders in. And that's the concept that, that we have routinely collected data sitting largely in government departments collected for all of our lifetime. And we, as a researcher, I would often plan a research project to go out and answer questions that could be answered by simply using that existing routinely collected data, linking data from the various parts of the health system, but also with school, with the, the um, corrective services data, with other aspects of our lives, so that we can look at what are the determinants of a particular outcome, whether they be a health outcome, a justice outcome, a social outcome, an educational outcome. And, and it's, a, it's been, over the last 10 to 20 years, a huge and growing area, and Western Australia has, has led the way. Uh, I think there's a risk, though, that we are starting to fall behind, uh, and we, we have the opportunity to reassert our position. Um, the risk is that there are, there are processes that get in the way, um, processes of which understandably are motivated by the right, the right motivations, which is protecting the privacy of individuals. Uh, and so uh, when our researchers are trying to get access to linked data for a particular purpose, in some instances it can take a year to two years to get access to that data. And if you've got a PhD student who's got a three-year project, it's pretty hard to advise them to enter into that sort of process. Now, I, I know there's a lot of interest in this in, uh, in Western Australia and how to make it much better and much more streamlined while still protecting the privacy of the individual. I think there's ways to do it. The reality is that, to my knowledge, there hasn't been a significant breach of privacy from data linkage, not just in this country, but when I've asked around anywhere. Um, so the, if the motivation is the data are there, and when you go and ask people, do they think we should use their routinely collected data to answer important questions, the answer is inevitably yes. Is their primary motivation the protection of their privacy? It's actually usually not. It's usually the primary motivation is use the data. Um, and that we, if that is the primary aim, and if that comes from the very top, then the people who are charged with a very difficult position of being a custodian of the data need to essentially feel like there's a much easier way for them to release that data. So I think that's a discussion that I know is happening, but we have the potential to, to, to mine that gold field of data much more effectively. Mm, good. Well, Larissa, I just wonder if I could ask you a question from the agricultural sector. Um, you, you talked a bit about innovation and, and improving productivity uh, a little while ago. There are also some serious challenges that the agricultural sector faces in terms of decreasing rainfall, salinity, uh, acidification of the soil and so on. Can data analytics actually assist in that process to improve those challenges, uh, mm. to address those challenges? Absolutely, Peter, but we are falling behind. So we don't have universal coverage at a farm unit level or a soil uh, type level or a catchment level. Uh, we need, um, we, we have recently invested in Doppler radar and the grain belt, but we need universal farm coverage and uh, telecommunica telecommunications coverage throughout the grain belt. Our um, producers are hungry for connectivity. Um, they want to make decisions on, um, based on cloud-based data, accounting data or financial data from their produc um, production base. But they want to use um, remote sensing technology, yield mapping. Um, but you know, if the head is kind of going up the hill and a 10 metre elevation increase means that the 4G drops out, that's not, that's not possible, right? Mm. So we are falling behind um, in that regard, yep. All right. If I could just lead into you, Colin, then. I, uh, you're co-chairing a round table at the moment, uh, at the Premier's request, to look at the marine science sector. Um, how is that process going in terms of linking industry with academia and the utilisation of data? Okay, well, um, Peter is the other co-chair, just in case anybody <laughs> didn't know that. So um, uh, maybe just recap, there's the, there's the Marine Science 2050 Blueprint, which was uh, uh, launched by the Premier a few months ago, and that really moved this, this issue forward. And, uh, 
I, mean, I would say e even getting that blueprint together was a success story in terms of collaboration between end users, a number of industries, um, oil and gas, um, commercial fishing, recreational fishing, and so forth, agri uh, agriculture, um, and researchers. So great document which really pointed to the fact you needed to take a, uh, a, you know, a long-term view of understanding and researching the oceans that are around uh, Western Australia. So that, that set the framework, and then Peter and I were asked to, to co-chair the round tables. And th this has proved to be a very um, beneficial process. I mean, that we have uh, people who are committed to working together to find what are the, what are the right areas of research we need to do, um, what do we need to do with existing data, and so forth, to improve our understanding so that when we want to carry out new investments, whether it's oil and gas, um, new ports, etc., that both the investor and the regulators have a really good, clear understanding of what the marine environment currently is and, and then are able to understand the potential impacts on, the, on that environment. Um, this, is, this is necessary because, candidly, at the moment, we don't have, a, you know, by and large, we don't have adequate information in time, often, and, and so we end up with some quite onerous, say, environmental conditions to deal with a lack of data, a lack of information, um, or we take a long time to get the information that delays investment decisions. So I think there's a, there is a good, strong Im economic imperative to, to work together. Um, uh, the other aspect, I think, which you know, we need to understand is that the social licence to operate in all of those industries uh, is not something we can take for granted. And so we need to generate enough information to share with people who need to be convinced and have a right to be convinced that we're actually investing uh, and developing in, in the, the oceans in a sustainable manner. Um, and so that's, there are some really strong drivers for people to work together. Now, exactly where it's going to end up, Peter, we don't exactly know at the moment. The main thing is we have people from uh, all the sectors in the room, from all the relevant government agencies in the room, um, and uh, they, are look, they have identified what are the sort of initial priorities and what might be the long-term priorities. Now, how, how those are going to get addressed is, is a piece of work we're doing at the moment, um, and whether that collaboration takes the form of collaboration in funding or sharing of information um, is still to be defined. But I think I would almost declare this process has been successful to get to the point where we are, and anything from here is going to be a, re a real uh, upside. Uh, and I think this model that we're going through is, in fact, a good, I think will be a good model for other areas as well, where there is a, a genuine benefit in working, working together. Terrific. Sean, a little while ago you, you mentioned that you're working in a pretty large company. Um, how do you instill a culture of innovation throughout the company? And are there things that we can learn that can be transmitted to other sectors, academia, for example, or government and startups? Uh, right, uh, culture, probably the secret source, I reckon. Um, the instilling process, I, I, uh, Jonathan's comment about you have to be careful with the process that you, you put in place, that it isn't going to be a barrier at the end. Um, yeah, we, and I, I think as well, identify what you mean by innovation. If you're thinking about something that should be happening every day to improve someone's job day by day, you know, we kind of look at that at continuous improvement. If you're talking about directed innovation, and I think that's one thing that we did do, is that at Woodside, we direct innovation on business problems that connect to a business outcome. Um, and so there is a process that we do to, to keep people focused uh, on the right business problems. Um, but the, the, for us, it's all around what is the culture that you want at the end of the day. So any process brought in is around promoting that culture. And the one that we emphasise the most, and one that's kind of insightful if you look around your own organisations, is what happens when you fail. The, a good thermometer is what happens in your company, your government industry, your, your researcher, if you fail. How does people around them pick them up, learn from that failure and move on? And so we've certainly learnt to make the cost of failure very, very low, the learning opportunities very, very high, and if, you know, we kind of run by that motto of, uh, you know, when it comes to innovation, think big, because it needs to have a big impact. But prototype small, and that's that getting that failure cost really low. And then when it works, scale really fast. 
uh, to make that impact. Um, so for us, it's around whatever that process is to kind of make the failure minimal at the front end, and then increasingly as you go down the line to commercialization, it's more and more rigid um, because you're probably spending more and more money to get it to market. Um, but yeah, it, for us, it's all around directing that culture of um, it, it, if you're going to fail, fail fast, fail often, and learn. <laughs> I think learning is the important bit. There is, a, there is a new word out there, folks, if you haven't heard about it. It's called flurning. Google it, right? It's a combination of failure and learning. There's no such thing as failure. Jonathan, I wonder if I could just segue over to you and uh, ask you how you might envisage a, uh, a very vibrant biotechnology slash life sciences biomedical uh, industry here in Western Australia developing. I think we have to learn from the sort of things that Sean was talking about. Mm. So academia, learning from how the private sector works is pretty critical because again, it comes down to, you know, is it directed innovation or is it the traditional uh, model of discovery and then we see if we can take something forward. Uh, we're trying to do it through, in the first instance, through partnerships. Um, so we're signing partnerships with General Electric, for example, because they know we've got a whole lot of knowledge that they're, they're interested in getting access to. And that's leading to, th then they start asking the sort of questions that, that Sean was asking, which is, you know, what exactly are we trying to produce here and how can we focus on that? And, and that's led to, to a bit of a culture change in the organisation in some, circ some circumstances. And, you know, I was on the phone to, to a big pharma um, partner last night about a particular project which matches my interests and that it means that if you really focus that down to say by this time we can produce this then that's a different way of working for academia. I think there's a huge opportunity and, and I think the Premier's science statement really encompasses it which is that Western Australia has some very particular strengths and some selective advantages which relate to the knowledge that's here in this state. They relate to our geography, our isolation, but also um, our resources. And in the biotechnology sector, it also relates to the access to not only the knowledge, but the populations. So data linkage gives us an unparalleled opportunity to follow people through the life course. And that can fit into the sort of studies we need to understand not only biology, but also how to, to study a particular intervention. Um, I think what we, we have a huge opportunity, the big stumbling block, which I think Colin alluded to, is if it's based in academia, we're not good at taking it that next step. We're not good at working to a timeline that the private sector needs, and we need help with that. And that has to be through a sort of biotechnology startup approach. And, and I think we need, we need an incubator. We need an incubator of these new ideas where we can get some, not only the, the kit, the, the cutting edge kit that, that that researchers need to, if you like, uh, not have to invest themselves enormous amounts. So sort of low cost, getting together of um, individuals and organisations who are very interested in taking a gem of an idea through to the next stage. We need to be looking at, at how to finance it, better ways to support venture capital, better ways to look at whether it's you know, government R&D tax concessions or whatever it is. And um, allow someone like me who has a an institute full of very bright people to take that individual idea and think it's just too hard to, con to conceptualise how this might end up in a product and to make that a lot easier. Mm. Well, uh, that's a, a really nice point to come into agriculture, Larissa, and there is a continuum from when you make the first discovery right through to that final product. How do we ensure that we're getting the best outcome in terms of research activity in the agricultural field? The state has a fine history of doing that. We've got fabulous investments in herbicide resistance, in fungal pathology. Um, we've got a culture of um, uh, adaptation and extension um, through our grower networks and a very innovative farming base. So we've got a really good, I guess, um, grounding culture of, of R&D in ag. But, um, to meet these uh, market opportunities to our north, we need more investment. And I guess there's a concern in some parts of the food and ag spectrum that um, you know, our, our investment in state ag R&D is, is not sufficient at this point. And so industry and uh, the state government really need to, 
to come together and, and work on investing in the existing collaborative networks we've got. You know, we, we have been a world leader in dry land farming systems, so how can we take that and leverage it into those um, market opportunities to our north? Terrific. Colin, can I ask you about workforce? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's anticipated that uh, over the next 10 to 15 years, 40% of current jobs are going to disappear and that 75% of all new jobs are going to require STEM skills, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Are we preparing our kids well enough for the workforce of the future? Okay, well, sort of evidence would suggest not. Um, and if you look at Can the you hear um, yeah, chief, si chief scientist of Australia's uh, STEM strategy statement last year, um, in, in world terms, uh, participation in STEM subjects at school is declining. Um, and one of the interesting statistics or worrying statistics is that 40% of year 7 to year 10 children are being taught maths by teachers that don't have a mathematics teaching qualification. Um, I don't know how many of you were taught maths by people that didn't actually have a, have a maths teaching qualification. I, I certainly had good maths teachers throughout my, my school career. So, um, so that, that's a statement of concern and that sort of is reflected back into the Premier Science Statement uh, from earlier this year, which went on apart from looking at priorities to talk about the opportunities in education. And um, so what are we, I think, you know, what are we doing about it is most probably the, sort of the answer rather than you know, having defined the problem. So things like, I mean, organisations like SciTech, um, you know, the, the, the mission is to, uh, is to ensure that, you know, all West Australians uh, have a better understanding of, of, of STEM. And, and in, a, in the context of our children, it's not just the coming to the science centre, it's uh, professional development for teachers, it's going out into the community, going out into schools. So that's one area, and it's a well-respected organisation um, which is doing, doing a good job in that area. Um, TIAC, um, through, um, uh, I think, really on the leadership of, of Jim Ross, has been, has been developing, um, uh, I think STEM WA, which is looking to coordinate the activities of STEM providers and to look for more standardisation and approach and working with, with all the universities as well as the, the high schools and, and primary schools. So that's a positive development. I, I think the universities are doing their, their piece as well. And so if I look at, at Curtin, Curtin has relationships with, uh, with high schools like uh, Applecross Senior, uh, uh, Senior High School, um, uh, which has got um, STEM as one of its sort of sort of uh, centres in, in there. There's a centre of excellence in, in the school. And there's scholarships for STEM, STEM students. There's um, providing more and more students with uh, digi digital learning uh, so that, that they are aware of you know, the digital age. They have a, a, a fluency, a literacy in, uh, in, in STEM and, and in, di di in di digital area. So um, there's, there's a lot going on. Um, what's the role of business, I think, in this as well? Um, not well defined, I, I would say, and most probably not been too well embraced by business other than defining their needs. Um, but I think business maybe has got more, more, more scope to play, play in this space. I also think parents have a big role to play, and we don't necessarily like to say that parents don't, uh, don't you know, they, 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 they really need to understand, and the question is why don't they understand that their children need to study STEM subjects? And I think one of the things collectively we haven't done is we've defined the problem in terms of jobs will go away, not enough kids are doing STEM, but we haven't actually explained um, why STEM are going to, is going to be so important to the new jobs. And so I don't think we've quite created a cause and effect relationship yet that drives mums and dads to say to young Johnny in, uh, in year eight, you should stay with math, it's maybe hard but do the hard yards because it's going to be critical for your, your career development. Um, I, don't, I don't think we've got that message across. Um, and I think there's, an, uh, um, at times, philosophically in Australia, um, we pursue happiness in, uh, rather than success. <laughs> and um, so short-term short happiness is actually um, the, the avoidance of, concern, of, of, uh, of kids being upset and worried um, uh, 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 Without regard for their long-term success, I think it's actually quite a big, you know, a big issue, which is more than just governments throwing money at the problem. Certainly, and and it's it's, it's really a holistic society mm. society response to this issue. 
Yeah, I totally agree with you. Uh, Premier, we might wrap up this session with a final question to you. Uh, I was really surprised recently to find out uh, a study conducted by the, the Kauffman Foundation in the US that said over the past two decades, the greatest growth in jobs has actually occurred through companies that are less than five years old. That suggests that the startup and SME sectors are really important to job growth and job creation in the US. How do you see um, the startup SME sector in, in Western Australia, the entrepreneurs, the young people, the young Turks with energy? How do you see that sector developing in Western Australia? Uh, look, I think um, to some extent it's been slower here because we've had the, the natural advantages of, a, say, a major mining industry and petroleum and farming. Um, so maybe our need has been less than in, in other parts of the world. Um, the sector is still comparatively small if you measure it in terms of uh, size of our state product or GDP, but there's clearly going to be very fast growth. I think we need to uh, just keep a little bit of sense of balance though. Um, and uh, you know, if I look forward, um, the mining and petroleum industries are still going to be our dominant industries in 50 years' time. So I don't think we want to get ahead of the game and suddenly say that uh, forget the industries we've got, we're going to go into all these new areas and they'll take over. It won't happen mm. like that. C can I just add a couple of little odd unrelated comments, if I might, Peter? And I said before, you know, the challenge for me is to, to really think about, well, what government should do, and I'm guided by that principle, we should do what the sector can't do. But there's also just opportunistic things that happen. And uh, I'm not trying to push a particular barrow here, but some odd examples. For example, currently through Parliament we're putting through a City of Perth Act and you know, there's a bit of contention about that. What's been missed in the debate about that is that when I started that, one of the key things I wanted to achieve was basically a land bridge between the QE2 Medical Centre and the University of Western Australia. And that will fill up. Mm. And that idea comes from a, a visit to uh, Texas, the Texas Medical Centre, mm. which is this you know, conglomeration of university uh, and public health care. Um, that's an odd thing. Um, that chance will come and I think you know, you'll see them come together. Uh, another example, uh, in China, uh, I had, uh, went to Nanjing and uh, met with the party secretary, the guy who runs the show, um, uh, and I just mentioned our biodiversity. Uh, for no reason, uh, I was not aware that China's major botanic centre happens to be in the, in, near there in Jiangsu province. Out of that, uh, brief conversation, casual conversation, um, Department of Parks and Wildlife now has got a, a link, a collaboration, and there's lots of collaborations already, uh, and that could grow into something really quite significant. And I think also if I can just, in Larissa's area, talking about agriculture, and this is a current issue for government, uh, I accept what you say, Larissa, I don't think the science effort is as good as it should be from the state government, and we're, we're addressing that now. Uh, we've put a lot of emphasis into biosecurity, which is important, uh, but I think more, uh, maybe just sort of pure science, the genetic work and the like to have salt tolerant or drought tolerant species and, and all the rest of it is important. You mentioned putting um, Doppler radars out there to collect data and you know, I was convinced of the merit of that. They're sorts of things government should do. What I'm struggling with a little bit is where we draw the line between that fundamental research or fundamental infrastructure and where the private sector, the entrepreneurs, the innovators come in. And to some extent, in agriculture, um, I can see government needs to do more. Uh, I think a lot of the effort gets dissipated out in the wheat belt. Too many groups, too many agendas, uh, and they're, mm. they're some of the harder political issues. So you can't just be pure and sort of rush back to the, um, the chem lab and do pure research. You've got to think about the practical funding and policy and implication. And that's what I see as my job. Lots of far brighter people than me in this room that can do all the innovation. But for government, that's a tricky thing. To where do you draw that line? How do you define it? But I think in that case, Premier, it relates very much to what Jonathan was saying a little bit earlier, that the medical research sector was fragmented, to say the least, uh, three or four years ago. That sector has actually coalesced incredibly well in a very short period of time. And I'm guessing that the same thing could be done in each of the sectors that we have as our priorities. And for the good of the state, we need to do that. So on that note, on that upbeat note, uh, I'd like to bring this uh, wonderful discussion to a close. Uh, could you all please join me in thanking our wonderful panellists? Amen.